So you just got finished diving your local breakwater and you found some piece of junk that you decided you want to keep. How do you protect it? How do you clean it? And how do you preserve it for the future? Well, I have some techniques I've used over the years. Come take a look. Hey folks, welcome to another Water Trek 360. This is a comprehensive artifact preservation video that will show you how to use fairly common low-cost treatments and procedures to protect your newly found dive treasure. I've used many of these over the 40 plus years that I've been artifact hunting. So what prompted me to learn about artifact preservation? Well, it was my own naivete. It was in the early 1980s. I retrieved a grappling hook from a shipwreck in New Jersey that went down in the 1890s. I left it in my garage for the winter behind some power tools. When I retrieved it in the spring, it was a pile of red dust. That's when I knew I needed to learn more before I retrieved anything else. Today, before you take it, let alone keep it, make sure that you can. If you are diving in a national park, a marine protected area, any site under salvage, or if you're wreck diving, especially on a war grave, please follow the underwater guidelines for that site. If you are unsure, leave it. My most valuable artifacts came prior to the changes in maritime salvage laws enacted in the 1990s. So be respectful of where you are and if you can legally take any artifact. If it's garbage or plastic, please remove it. I'm not going to go into marine salvage techniques nor how to map, draw an underwater site. Those are whole other conversations. Maybe I'll do a video on those. If you are going to take something, it is your responsibility that you don't turn it potentially a valuable piece of antiquity into a red pile of dust. So let's look at what you need to do. Site preparation. If it is truly an artifact, then protect it from the moment that you see it. Most folks where I dive bring a catch bag with them, uh, affectionately called a ditty bag. If you don't have one, you know, you have two hands. Hold on to whatever you have securely, and depending upon the artifact, just don't shove it into the bag and continue your dive dragging it along the bottom. I've seen many times an excited diver bring up a cute little bottle, and then there's a nice, bright, shiny crack right through the middle of it. Oops. If you are in an area known for, say, old bottles, inside the bag, keep some uh, rags or towels, something like that. Keep the bag close to your body. Don't bang it around or throw it onto the boat deck. Instruct the boat hand that there's an artifact in the bag and be careful. Once on the boat, depending upon the item, you may need to keep it submerged, wet, in a bucket or something, a catch bag hanging over the side. The arch enemy of long submerged artifacts, especially wood and iron, is air. You do not want it to dry out until you are ready to dry it out. Once the dive is over, comes the ride home. Keep the item covered. I always bring some garbage bags like this uh, or wet towels to ensure that it doesn't get rolled around or banged and kept wet, especially glass, ceramics, porcelain. I also keep boxes, crates, brown paper bags, bubble wrap, whatever. Plan ahead if diving a site where you might find something. Once you get home, the real work begins. Before you put your gear away, put the artifact in an appropriate sized plastic storage container. Fill it with enough water to cover the artifact. 
until you determine the remediation process required for said artifact and have all of the components and tools you need. Depending upon the age of your artifact and how long it's been submerged, especially in salt water, this could be a long process, months, even years. We'll look at how to restore artifacts based on the type of material that it's made of. I'll start with the easier ones first. I know you're excited to see what's under all that encrustation, but I can't stress enough. Before you start any restoration, make sure you have the right tools and all the right chemicals. If you feel unsure about doing any of these techniques, contact someone who can do the restoration. If you damage it, it may be permanent. Important note, safety first. I always recommend rubber gloves and eye face shields when using chemicals or these, any of these treatments. Follow all safety and disposal procedures. Go slowly and be patient. So let's start with stone. I get it. Stone, what's there to do? Well, what if you found a really nice old arrowhead, right? Well, soak it in warm water to loosen any debris, you know, use mild dish soap or detergent, brush it off with either a stiff plastic brush or even a wire brush to remove any debris. It depends on the type of stone. Soft sandstone versus, say, granite, use a different brush. Obviously, sandstone is a little tough. Good luck with the diamonds. <laughs> Rinse in distilled water and air dry. If it has a polished or flat edge, you may want to shine it up. I like these stones, I use them for some small pieces of artwork. You can put a light coat of, uh, of acrylic or polyurethane. Glass. Glass is normally relatively easy to clean, especially if you found it in fresh water. Uh, using a soft plastic basin versus a sink. This helps prevent breakage in, in case you drop it. Soak in warm water. This loosens any of the calcium deposits and leaches out the chlorides and salts if it's been in salt water. Do not use extremely hot or cold water in your wash. Weaker, older glass, especially those with embedded bubbles in the glass wall, can crack with rapid temperature change. You may need to soak this for a day or so. It depends on how encrusted. When cleaning, use a mild detergent, soft brushes, uh, not wire. If you need to clean inside, get yourself some bottle brushes. The, uh, the, the sprays function on a sink or a faucet hose can do the same trick and help loosen up debris from narrow places. I mean, there are sink faucet bottle washer jets that can get into narrower interior sections of the glass. If the internal debris is stubborn and the opening is wide enough, try half filling the artifact with unpopped popcorn and shake vigorously to loosen any uh, difficult debris. Unless, of course, it's delicate glass or if it's cracked, then avoid this step. Extremely difficult debris may require soaking longer in a weak acid like household vinegar or even a diluted 2% sulfuric acid uh, if it's heavily encrusted. You can use scrubbing brushes as long as, again, it's not fragile. But as a reminder, do this underwater uh, to reduce the risk of dropping it. And remember, you may end up scratching the glass. Please wear rubber gloves when using anything acidic, even vinegar. Once done, rinse and soak in distilled water and let it air dry. If you want to shine it up, you can always rub it with a cloth dipped in linseed oil, lemon, or baby oil even. If the glass was, say, buried in sediment, this way there's not a lot of incrustation on it, and protect it from wave motion. If it's been tumbled around and exposed and 
kind of damaged externally, I leave it in place. I actually kind of like having some residual encrustation on the artifact. It kind of shows where it came from underwater. It's a preference. Next up are porcelain and ceramics. These in many ways are more fragile than glass. They are porous, glass is not. Protect them every step of the way. Wrap them underwater, keep them wet on the boat and during the transport home. As soon as you get home, put them into a fresh water bath ASAP. You don't want any of the artwork potentially flaking off due to dryness. Porcelain is denser and less porous than ceramic. Porcelain is usually made out of a more refined clay and fired at higher temperatures, hence normally easier to clean. Be more conservative with the ceramics than porcelain to clean. Again, use warm water and a soft brush. Gently remove the debris. Try not to bang or scrape the artifact perpendicularly so you don't break it, especially around delicate areas like cup handles. There, try using a cotton swab. If it is highly encrusted, you can use a weak 2% vinegar bath for short periods but rotate between a freshwater bath and a vinegar bath to reduce any damage. Take one cup of 5% vinegar and mix it with, with two cups of water. And then, as I mentioned, rotate between the freshwater and vinegar bath as needed. Versus doing one long bath. This reduces the potential impact to any of the artwork. You may find animal encrustations have left marks or discolorations from lime deposits or even iron deposits from other debris that uh, it may have been resting against. Here, use a cotton swab with vinegar directly on the stain. If that doesn't work, try some bleach. And if that doesn't work, try some ammonia. The key here is to use small quantities on the swab and then immediately rinse with fresh water, removing all residual chemicals. Once dry, let it air dry. If you want to shine it up, use a light coating of varnish or acrylic plastic or even resin. Uh, I would not do this if you think the piece has true value, uh, then leave it as is and get it appraised. These plates came from a wreck that went down in 1862. I chose not to put a finish on them for that exact reason. Pottery. Pottery can be glazed or unglazed. Let them soak in fresh water for up to a week, potentially more if you think they're really old. For glazed pottery, the techniques used depend upon the level of encrustation and are similar to ceramics. So you can follow those procedures when you know doing pottery. However, they are more prone to flaking than ceramics, so keep them wet until treatment begins. And be delicate when removing any encrustations. Regardless of which tool you use, go gently. Minimally soak in fresh water for a week or so, changing the water daily. Then wash with warm soapy water and rinse with distilled water. Then, immediately, when still wet, transfer to an alcohol bath of either rubbing alcohol or denatured alcohol for at least one day. Remove, air dry, and then use a light coating of clear varnish, acrylic, plastic, or commercial resin if desired. Unglazed pottery. Unglazed pottery is more porous than glaze, as I mentioned. If your artifact is unglazed, I would leave it in a fresh water bath for two weeks, changing the water at least every other day, if not daily. Do not use any acidic solvents, including vinegar, none. Wash with warm water 
in a mild dish soap using a very, very soft brush or cloth. Be careful not to dislodge any ink or patina. This may take several iterations. Patience is key. Rinse and let sit for a day in distilled water. Then immediately move it to another bath of either rubbing alcohol or denatured alcohol and let it sit for one more day. Remove it, let it air dry, and then, and completely, this may take a couple of days since it is more porous, depending upon humidity. Then, you know, you could give it a light coat of varnish again, lacquer or acrylic sealant. This, again, depends on whether or not the artifact has potential value. Metals. I know everybody fantasizes about finding money, gold. <laughs> Good luck, all you wannabe Mel Fishers. Again, I'll go from easy to hard. Gold. It's really not a lot to do here if you're lucky enough to find it. It really only needs to be brushed and clean, unless it's highly encrusted in some kind of calcification. If so, you can use a brief 10% bath of sulfuric or acetic acid. This should remove any of the carbonates. Then you brush, rinse, and clean. Yeah, lucky dog. <laughs> Lead. Again, not much to do here. Scrub clean with fresh water. These would be mostly old fishing weights anyway, like this bell weight here. Lead, tin, and pewter, once on the surface, normally don't corrode. The artifact should be cleaned only for aesthetic reasons or to reveal something underneath that you want to show. Tin. Tin is a soft metal, so soft that it's usually combined with something else. Most old tin artifacts are actually iron or steel plated with tin. True tin that's been underwater for a long time can break down and seldom survives in a marine environment. This is due to the transformation of the tin into a mix of stannous or stannic oxide, even into what is commonly referred to as tin pest or tin disease. Tin is one exception to the freshwater soap we've talked about. You may want to try to clean it as quickly as you can once you get home. Tin can rust, although it's not really the tin, it's the metal that it is bonded to. Like this one from the late 1930s, which uh, contains winged musket caps. Usually I would just knock off any incrustation, dry it thoroughly and lead it, and then coat it with either wax or lacquer if needed. Unless there's some inscription or pattern you wanted to get at. I know there are some folks who say you can soak or clean in vinegar, but I do not suggest using acids, vinegar, and salt solution if done in really warm or hot water can damage, even dissolve, the tin. If you do want to use vinegar, use a solution less than 2%, a weak acid, and for very short periods of time. Why do I say no to vinegar? Tin is an anode which means during the chemical reaction, it loses more electrons than it gains versus a metal, say, like copper, which is a cathode. Tin is a very chemically sensitive material. Therefore, for me, nothing acidic. If the tin is not painted, I suggest a Luke Cool bath with a tablespoon of baking soda mixed with three cups or so of water. Do not use hot water or distilled water. Let it soak until the incrustation is soft and then remove the debris. If it needs more cleaning, you can redo it or make a paste using two tablespoons of baking soda and you know, a cup of water or so. You can then use a soft toothbrush or cloth to rub off any remaining incrustation. Again, be gentle. For a non-painted surface, once the incrustation is gone and you want to shine it up, there are several techniques you can use to clean and polish. One, barkeeper's friend. 
Barkeeper's friend, though, is caustic, so make sure you wear gloves. Use it in small quantities and use it quickly. Do not soak the artifact in the solution. This is time sensitive and needs to be cleaned quickly. It can destroy your object. Once done, let it sit and dry before applying another treatment if needed, but buff with a wet sponge. Again, this compound can scratch, so I recommend the liquid version. Two, you can use toothpaste, aluminum oxide. You want one with a medium or low abrasiveness. Don't use tartar control or a whitening paste. Use one for sensitive teeth. I will leave a link showing the abrasiveness index of toothpaste in the description. Apply with a soft brush or cloth, let it sit for a minute or so, and then rinse off and wipe down. Three. Apply Brasso or some other metal polish. Follow the individual instructions. Uh, they do vary. If there isn't a lot of incrustation or the artifact has a painted surface, use a mild dish detergent and, again, nothing warm, just cool water. And if you need to, get a cotton swab and use either boiled linseed oil or mineral spirits. Dip the swab into the cleaner of choice and gently rub along the areas needing cleaning. Do this slowly until the, it's clean to your desired level. Do not overdo it. You want to avoid removing any paint. Wipe and air dry. If you're worried about continuing rust, which can happen, you can apply a very light coat of lacquer or better yet, beeswax or carnauba wax. Keep the conditioned tin, reconditioned tin, out of direct sunlight as it accelerates the corrosion process. Pewter, especially really old pewter is an alloy made mostly of tin and lead, or sometimes even copper and antimony, or nickel. Lead in pewter was discontinued in recent times for obvious health reasons. Pewter will oxidize to the same compounds as the two parent metals, so lead and tin. Pewter that contains lead sometimes develop a grayish black colorization or patina on the surface. The condition of pewter artifacts in the marine environment depends on the percentage of tin to lead. Usually, the more lead in the pewter, the better it survives in marine environments. Versus lead-free pewter or low percentage lead. Lead-free pewter can suffer extensive corrosion in the aerobic sea salt water. In contrast, in anaerobic environments, meaning those with little oxygen, both leaded and lead-free pewter survive in generally good condition. Pewter artifacts can often have wart-like blisters on them on the surface of the metal, usually from localized contaminants. Try not to remove these. Under most of them, there's either going to be pits or holes in the metal. Really, really old pewter should be treated like tin, which is the more anodic and chemically sensitive of the metal. Therefore, again, I suggest no acids and don't soak it in distilled water. Use tap water. Distilled water can react with the metals. First, try soaking in a mild dish soap and lukewarm warm water. Clean with a soft brush or cloth. Again, if you're going to use vinegar, use a solution that is less than 2% and only for a short time. Another method is to use sodium bicarbonate or baking soda, which has a pH roughly of 8 to 9. Make a paste, clean with a soft cloth or brush. Do not use sodium carbonate. It has a pH around 11.5, which is way too high and can damage the piece. Another method is to use a soft cloth soaked in denatured alcohol and gently scrub away any of the residual debris. Once the incrustation is gone and you want to polish it up, you can follow the same toothpaste method as outlined for tin or use a commercial pewter polish like Haggerty or Brasso. Again, follow the instructions for the specific agent. Uh, they do vary. And do a test patch first before you apply to the entire artifact. Whew. 
bronze copper, as long as it's not really old copper. There are several techniques you can use to clean bronze copper, depending upon how encrusted they are. Uh, care needs to be taken if these are coins versus, say, a boiler valve. For lightly encrusted pieces, for the initial soaking, you can use a variety of different solvents. And you soak in the artifact in the bath of Worcestershire sauce, white vinegar and salt. That's an or, white vinegar and salt, or baking soda and water. You leave for an hour or so, depending upon encrustation, and then use a soft brush to clean off debris. Repeat this process as needed. Then rinse in fresh, not distilled water, and let air dry. You can use a commercial bronze or copper cleaner, but as with anything, closely follow the directions since these have other additives as well. And go easy with the brush. These are soft metals and can scratch easily. Silver. Silver is another soft metal. Uh, the challenge with silver, though, it tends to attract carbonates and sulfides. Uh, this, too, has several techniques to clean. Uh, after fresh water to loosen the debris, uh, you can make a paste of baking soda and warm water and rub the artifact with the paste using a cloth, rag, or soft brush to scrub off the debris. Rinse with fresh water and let dry. For slightly more encrusted pieces, soak the silver in a 50% ammonia and water bath for an hour. Rinse off and transfer to another bath of 1% sulfuric acid. Soak for an hour. Rinse well while using a soft brush to clean it off, like a toothbrush to clean the debris. Please be wearing gloves. For bigger or more heavily encrusted pieces, soak it in a bath of 10% lye and water. Soak the artifact until you see the incrustation is pasty and soft. This is obviously dependent uh, upon size of the artifact and the amount of incrustation. Flush with fresh water while scrubbing with the brush. You can repeat this process until the debris is gone or is at a desired state that you wish. Rinse again and polish as needed. Really old copper. Really old copper artifacts may need an electrolytic method to convert the metallic copper, the oxides, and the chlorides back into their original states. This is a long method, so take care when doing this. Make a bath solution of 1% lye in a plastic container or bucket large enough to hold the artifact. Take an old nickel or two, depending upon the size of the artifact, and wrap the nickels with a long piece of copper wire. Then wrap the artifact with another copper wire and suspend the artifact into the solution in the bucket hanging from a wooden dowel or something. Connect the copper wire for the artifact to the negative terminal of a DC power source, say a battery charger set at two amps. Connect the copper wire with the nickels to the positive terminal of the power source. Turn on your power source. This creates a chemical reaction. If you see bubbles coming from the copper, then you know that it is working. Depending upon the size of the artifact, this could take up to a week. When done, shut down the system, do that first, <laughs> remove the wires from the power source, wash the artifact in fresh water. If needed, washing it again in either vinegar or 2% acetic acid solution and brush again. When done, do a final rinse and polish as desired. Aluminum. 
Aluminum only started being used commercially on a large scale in the early 1900s. While aluminum doesn't rust per se, it is prone to corrosion in a marine environment. When salt water and salt air come into contact with aluminum, they can cause a white chalky coating of aluminum oxide and pitting of the metal, which can then weaken the object. There are several methods you can use to clean. One, vinegar. Mix one part of white vinegar with one part water, not distilled. Soak the heavily encrusted pieces until the debris is soft. To speed up the process, first boil the water before you add the vinegar. Let it sit in solution for 30 minutes or so before cleaning it with a brush or, or cloth. Two, if it's not heavily encrusted, you can use a mild detergent in warm water. Again, use a non-abrasive sponge or cloth. Aluminum can scratch easily. Rinse well. Three, Borax. You can find it in the laundry aisle. When you combine borax with a small amount of water, it forms a light paste that is good for loosening uh, residue. Uh, use a non-abrasive sponge or cloth again, scrub the object until it's shiny, and then rinse. If the residue is thicker, you can apply this paste directly to the problem area and use an old toothbrush to scrub it off. Rinse well and dry. If you need a more heavy-duty cleaning solution, mix one tablespoon of baking soda with two cups of water, create a paste, then add salt and vinegar to the mixture. Apply the paste to the aluminum, uh, then again soft brush to scrub, rinse with fresh water, and dry. Lastly, again, you can use a commercial cleaner, follow the instructions, to a test area, inconspicuous place so you don't damage the finish. Rinse the surface, making sure you wipe off all cleaner and get rid of that. Uh, rinse it with uh, fresh, warm water. Then soft cloth to buff. With any of these, you can apply a protective coating once dry. There are spray-ons or wax you can use to keep it shiny. Iron, steel. Iron can be tricky. Ferrous metals, especially older pre-steel iron, had a lot of impurities in it. The old pig iron, wrought iron, wasn't created in the same way as modern steel. When older iron sits under water for a long time, especially salt water, it can take on a very grainy appearance, uh, almost looking like wood. The problem here are the absorbed sea salts and trace elements in the iron. Once the iron, old iron, is exposed to air, it can rust quickly, and the oxidation process can be fast and irreparable, as my pile of red dust. Again, there are several methods depending upon age and incrustation. First, keep it wet. Don't let the oxidation start or as little as possible before you get it home. Then, you know, cover it on the boat, cover it on the way home. Once home, let it soak in fresh water. You may need a really large container like I did for this Admiralty anchor that I got off a wreck uh, uh, in New Jersey. Admiralty anchors like this were widely used in the 1800s. Anything that's been underwater and under pressure for a while, even iron, will leach out those trace elements and salts once it's back at ambient sea level pressure. Some say soak one month for every 10 years that it was underwater. Do the math. <laughs> I let this guy soak for almost a year. Soak in a warm water, I mean a, a water bath, changing the water at least weekly. Let it, let it sit. So, method one. If it's not too bad, you can just cover it with polyurethane. If it's mildly encrusted, you know, cover the artifact in vinegar of at least 20% or greater. Soak the item for 24 hours or more. Uh, remove, scrape off any rust and debris repeat as needed, 
rinse in fresh water, uh, let it air dry, and then, you know, coat it in a layer of Penetrol. Let it dry 12, 24 hours, should be good to go. Next method. You can put, oh, by the way, you can pour that vinegar out and use it in an area you want to kill weeds and stuff like that. It's safe to go. Next method. After the required soaking, you can submerge and clean off any incrustation with a brass or steel brush. Try to do this uh, while it's still under water. Trying not, again, to gouge any of the soft irons. Use a light sandpaper to take off any lime. Flush with fresh water, air dry, and immediately cover in, you know, polyurethane, plastic, uh, or lacquer, even Penetrol if you want, but not for these older pieces. The next method, follow the instructions for the previous one prior to the sandpaper. Put the artifact into a solution of muriatic acid and water. Follow the mixing instructions from the muriatic acid's container. Let it soak for a few hours up to a week, depending upon incrustation. You will see bubbles. When the bubbles stop, remove the artifact. Now, with this, be careful. Don't overdo it, especially on older pieces. If the incrustation looks loose enough, remove it, put it in a freshwater bath, and scrape off all the debris. Once done, let it sit in the freshwater bath for a few days and then rinse it all off under running water, fresh water, to remove any of the remaining acid. It's very important to get rid of the acid before you do anything else. You can then sand lightly, let it air dry, and then, you know, immediately apply, you know, polyurethane, acrylic, or lacquer finish if you want. If covered with mostly lime, since it was in fresh water, you can use the same method, basically, as before, but switch from muriatic acid to nitric acid. For heavily encrusted pieces or old salt-damaged iron, brush off the heavy rust and debris and encrustation as best you can. Again, don't scrape into soft iron. Make a bath of 10% sodium hydroxide, which is basically lye. Cover the entire artifact and let the item soak for four to five weeks. Some folks sprinkle granulated zinc over the artifact, which can be absorbed into the ferrous metal. Uh, I've never really had much success with this zinc method, unless it was a smaller item and you heat it in a bath on a stove in a metal pot, which is really only practical for smaller items. Another method is to use navel jelly, which is a truly wondrous item for rust removal. Clean and brush the artifact in fresh water. Submerge it into a freshwater bath with just enough water to cover the entire artifact while it's underwater. Slowly pour the navel jelly phosphoric acid, which is basically what it is, over the entire artifact. Bubbles will form, you know, working navel jelly's magic. Every hour or so, repeat the process until the desired amount of rust is removed. Softly brush off the item while rinsing in a fresh water from a faucet or in a fresh water bath. Air dry and immediately pl apply polyurethane, acrylic plastic, or lacquer. The next method is the longest lasting and used on usually the worst pieces that have been down a long time. It's an electrolysis method. You set up a fresh water bath using a large plastic bucket or container. Attach one or more pieces of rebar vertically inside the bath. Uh, each piece of rebar should stick up over the edge of the bucket. Uh, you can create a daisy chain wrapping each piece of rebar with copper wire. Fill the bucket with three quarter of the way with water and for each gallon of water you add a tablespoon of sodium carbonate which is effectively laundry detergent. Not baking soda, that's sodium bicarbonate and that really doesn't uh, work as well. 
mix the solution well. Wrap a steel wire around the, a raw piece of metal of the artifact, meaning you got to clean off as much rust in the contact area where the wire is attached to the artifact. This is important to create uh, enough current. Hang the steel wire from a dowel into the solution, making sure the artifact is fully submerged. It can be on the bottom, just not exposed to air. Do not use a copper wire on the artifact. Keep all copper out of the liquid solution. Using a power source like car battery charger, at least you know at a two amp setting, attach the negative connector of the power source to the steel wire attached to the artifact. Then connect the positive connector to the copper wire on the protruding piece or pieces of rebar that are kind of daisy chained together. Keep this copper wire above the water solution. Turn on the charger. Once you see bubbles, you will know that it's working. Let it sit a couple hours or so, checking on it occasionally. This too may take some time. When the incrustation looks like that it's about to fall off or is detached, Shut off the power system, <laughs> the can in a bucket, remove the artifact, and clean off the freshwater debris in a freshwater bath. You can repeat this step as often as you need. After the electrolysis is done, the iron should look black, or at least blacker, uh, due to the chemical process. Clean off the artifact while rinsing in fresh water. Then get some rust converter. Cover the artifact with the rust converter and let it dry. Again, making sure you, you know, use gloves when you do any of this. Once it's dry, wipe it down. It can then take on a black sheen in some areas, but now it is more rust resistant. For this method, please follow these critical safety items. Because safety first. One, keep copper out of the solution. Do this in a well-ventilated area. Use a fan or some kind of air circulation uh, to disperse the, the gases that are coming out of solution. If you use standard rebar or, you know, like galvanized metal, as I outlined, you are fine from a disposal standpoint, as much as we are today under today's guidelines. Do not use stainless steel in place of rebar. Yes, it is a good conductor. But in this process, depending upon the stainless steel that you're using, it can break down, producing a chemical called hexavalent chromium, which is a carcinogen, which means you are now mandated to dispose of it properly at a hazardous waste facility. Most towns aren't equipped for this. If you use this method and use stainless steel, do not pour your solution out down the drain. You will contaminate your town's out water outflow system. And you could and should get arrested for not disposing of this properly. Think Aaron Brockovich. Look it up. Hexavalent chromium. Check with your local town for hazardous waste disposal with any chemical you use at home. Bottom line. Do not use stainless steel for this process. Wood. Wood submerged for a long time obviously absorbs any trace elements from said water. In fresh water, wood fares much better. Salt water has marine boring worms that minimally make holes throughout the, the piece and at worst, consume any portions left uh, exposed. Here again, be careful underwater. Just because an object looks solid, it may have the consistency of wet cardboard. If you pull it or move it, it can simply fall apart. You should always test it first to see if it's sturdy enough to move. If it's soft, leave it, or at least wrap it up. Try not to bend it. Once on the surface, air can cause shrinkage, warping, cracking, uh, or even disintegration of the artifact itself. Submerge it, wrap it, keep it wet. 
you need to make sure that the cell structure inside stays intact, especially on really old pieces. This means replacing the water in the cells with something else, wax, paraffin, xylene, something that won't evaporate over time. So method, if you have a small enough piece, make a batch of alum powder, glycerin, and water, equal parts. Then using a small pan or pot, bring that solution to boil, put your artifact into the pot, remove it from the heat, and let it cool naturally over two days. Take the artifact out of solution after two days, let it dry completely, and then coat it with a mixture of one half turpentine and linseed oil. When dry, coat with polyurethane, acrylic, plastic, or resin. That's the process I used for these wooden spools that I recovered from the wreck of the Onondaga, or Onondaga, which sank in 1918 off the coast of Rhode Island. Please be careful when using one half turpentine and linseed oil. This solution is highly combustible. Do not leave rags or let them sit in a garbage container or something like that. The evaporation process can cause spontaneous combustion. Dispose of them properly. Method two. This is a lengthy process. You know, you put the wood into a bath of 30 to 40 percent denatured or ethyl alcohol. This is really for older bad pieces, right? You put it in there for at least two days. Then you remove it and put it into another bath of at least 70% denatured or ethyl alcohol and leave it for two more days. You remove it a third time and put it in a third bath of at least 95% denatured or ethyl alcohol for two more days. If the wood is not super old, super, super old, you can stop here dry it off and coat it with poly, lacquer, or resin. If it's been submerged a really long time, over 100 years, well over 100 years, then follow these additional steps. Make a bath in a metal or glass container of 100% commercially available xylene. Soak it for four to five days. Once it's done, move it to another xylene bath into which you have saturated with paraffin wax shavings. Try to get as much paraffin wax dissolved into the bath as is possible. Then soak your artifact for at least four weeks. Remove it, allow it to completely air dry. This may take a few days. And then later you can remove any of the beaded paraffin wax or anything else that's on the top with a warm cloth or brush, gently cleaning it. The next method is pretty much the same as the last one, but instead of xylene, you switch to acetone. So after those other steps, you let it soak two days in the acetone. Then you take the wood out of the acetone, put it aside. Now you Add to your acetone bath thinly cut strips of transparency film paper. That's the stuff used for inkjet printers. I mean, cut it really thin. Add as many strips as you possibly can to the acetone until they stop being absorbed. It looks really syrupy and thready. Then you put your artifact back into the, uh, into the bath and you let it soak for two more days. If the acetone evaporates a little bit, just add acetone to it. You don't need to put any more of the strips in. Once it's done, you take it out, you let it fully dry, and then clean it with a cloth or brush, and you can coat it then later with the poly. With any of these techniques that you have here, please dispose of the acetone and xylene baths properly. Check with your local town for proper waste disposal. These techniques will help preserve the cell structure, uh, but have a little more involvement in the cleanup process. The next process can work, but I am not sure of the long-term internal cell structure durability. And depending upon the size of the artifact, it can be challenging. 
Soak the artifact in boiled linseed oil in a closed container. And when I say boiled linseed oil, I don't mean boiling linseed oil, I mean boiled linseed oil. Let it soak for a week, maybe two, depending on the age of, of the artifact. Linseed oil with or without turpentine can be combustible. Do this out in the shed. After a week or so, remove the artifact and let it air dry. Now, drying time for just linseed oil may be two to three weeks. Once dry, cover it with some poly, you know, some other sheen. <whistles> Leather. Most of the techniques that we have for restoration of wood apply to leather. If it's really iffy, minimally do the progressive two-day baths in alcohol and then the 30 to 40, 60 to 70, 95 to 100 in one of the alcohols. Once dry, there are commercial leather preservation chemicals and salt removal products that you can use like sapphire. I use them sparingly and follow the directions carefully as with anything they have other ingredients. Another method I haven't tried and that is to slather the leather in Vaseline. Wrap it in plastic wrap and let it sit for a few days or a week and then simply wipe it off. The key here is that it needs to have moisture and elasticity into the leather. Cork. Cork, like wood, will shrink once exposed to air. If the cork is needed for your artifact and needs to have its original size, like this bottle that I recovered from the wreck of the Lizzie D, a rum runner that sunk in October of 1922, I needed the cork to retain the liquid. Soak the cork in warm water until it's back into its original shape. Dry off the exterior and then use a commercial cork sealant to trap the moisture inside. I then glued this cork to the bottle so that it couldn't pop off. Animal remains. While we frown upon taking shells, etc., and in fact many places do not even allow you to do so, if you do find a shell, once you clean it up, you can follow the same techniques as glass for the most part. And then when you're done and it's dry, you can coat uh, with a thin application of nail polish to shine it up if you want. For biological materials, unless you are eating them, Formaldehyde or a solution of at least 70% alcohol works best. Store in a glass container, not plastic. Some plastics may react poorly and you'll have a mess. For these channel whelk egg casings, I merely let them air dry after soaking them in an alcohol solution for a few days. Air dry. Ordinance, bullets, shells don't take ordinance. It is unstable. It can go off as it's sitting drying in the hot sun on a boat deck. These bullets you see in the picture I removed in 1983 from the USS San Diego. That was a 490 foot cruiser sunk in World War I by a mine off the south coast of Long Island. I have subsequently had them remediated so they are no longer a problem but this is a dangerous move leave ordinance alone these with a license you can take and taste really good lobsters get a license well that was a lot to cover this is a pretty comprehensive list of techniques most likely you won't need the more extreme measures unless the artifact is really, really old or in really poor condition. Any of the chemicals or products that I have mentioned are commercially available and you can get them online pretty much anywhere. To be clear, again, I am not advocating taking artifacts. 
as I said, please be respectful of marine parks, any dive sites policies, shipwrecks, war graves, marine life that may be living on the artifact or in the object that you are looking at, and follow any marine salvage laws. But if you are going to take an artifact, it is your responsibility to protect it from turning into a pile of dust. Follow all waste disposal laws. Be safe, especially when using harsh chemicals. Again, gloves, face shields. There are other ways to preserve these artifacts, but these are the techniques that I am familiar with and that I have found to work. I hope that you found this informative and it helps you with your artifact preservation. If so, hit the subscribe button. Anyway, I have a few more videos in the works, so stay tuned. I really hope you all are enjoying your dive experiences. And as always, my friends, until you see me next time, go explore, get wet.